I want to agree that there are really pressing issues in this world that have very little to do with how we run the digital age. So solving climate change, well, you know, having access to data might make a difference, so I'm not saying it's irrelevant. That's mainly other issues. For gender equality, women being all over the world, being well-educated, having equal opportunity, again, does not have a lot to do with digital age. So I'm not claiming this is the solution to everything. But what you could look is looking in the rear view mirror right now and looking at the future, you could be quite optimistic about the direction of those. And if you were to look, conversely, if you look forward, the digital world is about to become, or the digital economy is about to become most of the economy, actually for most people in the world. Certainly if we look 30 to 50 years into the future, that is the world. Already in the, the most developed or the, most, the richest countries, US, Western Europe, others, the digital economy is already actually the largest part of the economy. The I'm, I'm like even broader, broader, the information economy. I mean, for example, most of us, when we think of medicines that we take, you know, when we're ill, we don't think of them as part of the digital economy, but they're part of the information economy. Actually, what's inside of a medicine is information. And in fact, pretty much everything, I'm sitting on a chair right now. This chair is very much in the physical economy, but there's someone who designed it. There's probably a design, there's probably uh, automated machines that cut it up some of the components, Maybe it was assembled by hand or not. But more and more of our economy, even in areas that were traditionally physical, are now information or digital in that way. And so one point is that the future is, of an economy at least, is digital. Second, and this is the crucial point, is you mentioned, for example, inequality. And I'm even more interested in political instability. Inequality, at least unjustified inequality. I mean, I'm not someone who believes everyone should be paid exactly the same thing. But like when we have kind of extraordinary levels of inequality. When we get people who do work hard in a decent job not being able to make a living, then we have a problem, right? And that leads to political instability as people get upset. And what we're seeing in the world today right now is an incredible surge in populism. There's a huge wave of something going on. And in addition, we also see people pretty unhappy. Many, many Ordinary people are really worried about their jobs. In the rich, some of the richest countries, let alone poorer, they're worried about their jobs in the future. They're worried about how much they're going to get paid. Real wages for a majority of the population in many countries is stagnating. And while this may not have arrived in some of the middle-income countries, take China, just kind of going great in theory in China, but they plan to automate huge numbers of jobs in China in the next 10, 15 years. And so what I now want to explain is what I'm interested in really gives you an explanation. If you look at what's going on in this economy, you have a simple, profound explanation of these seismic shifts in politics and the economy, especially around inequality and instability. You have an explanation that also brings you to a really simple policy choice and opportunity a choice and an opportunity to go open rather than closed and to create a future of abundance and opportunity and freedom rather than of monopoly exploitation and control. The profound and simple change in a digital world is costless copying. Unlike physical goods, like my shoes here, my jacket, a car, it, for those things, copying is expensive. It costs just as much to make the next pair of shoes as to make the first one. But with information goods or digital goods, you know, the file for a piece of music, the file for a movie, the software, you can make a copy at basically no cost. Now, what we want to, th that's incredible. That means we're in this world of abundance. I can give out a billion copies of my piece of software. It's what makes open software possible, open source possible, and so on. But it also means, if you think about what happens for competition. So imagine that, as I often tell the story, we have an apple farmer world. We're all apple farmers. And to start with, we are making apples. And you know, we're all competing. And everyone makes a living. If you know, there's a limit, I can't make, I can only make so many apples. So you can make apples. And someone else can make apples. And we're all apple farmers. And there's good competition, which means that if I'm a really lazy apple farmer, I'll get out of business. If you're really good, you'll get more. Great. But what happens if one day there's an apple farmer who gets, has a magical apple tree that can produce unlimited numbers of apples every night at no cost? 
What will happen to the Apple market? Well, simple. That Apple farmer will stay around and everyone else will go out of business. And the Apple farmer will sell apples, not at the zero cost that it costs them, but at the cost just low enough to put everyone else out of business, to whole, have the whole market, just about. So what you'll have, that simple story tells you that as you move to costless copying and you have exclusive ownership of that apple tree, you'll end up with monopolies, you'll end up with dominance. That is just night follows day in a digital economy. Monopoly follows free competition with exclusive ownership. You will get monopoly. And worse than that, you'll get monopoly where once Mr. Gates, who owns this apple tree, has the monopoly, he can use that monopoly to prevent other people competing with him or her. They can actually use that to prevent new people coming along. So we need a solution to that, and the solution to that is quite simple, to make the apple tree open in a sense, allow everyone access to all the apples. However, the challenge then is how do we pay the person who put the effort in to create the tree in the first place? It costs money to make new movies, to come up with new software, to write new music. We need to pay creators and innovators well so they go on creating the things that can then be infinitely shared. So the question is, if, how do we do that? Now, if the only option were monopoly rights, were patents and copyright, we might say, oh, it's really sad they produce monopolies, but it's better to have a monopoly and have the medicine than to have no medicine at all. It's better to have windows than no windows at all. But that isn't the case. We can make open information and pay creators. And the way to do that is to replace monopoly rights with what I call remuneration rights. Remunerations are really simple. They say, instead of a patent which says you're allowed to control who use this, it says you will get paid, you will get remunerated from a, from a, from a source of money that we set up, the government or we collectively set up with subscription fees, you will get paid from that fund based on how much your creation is used. Now we already do that by the way. For example, music, when it gets played for example, in a bar, you don't ring up Madonna and say, hey, can I play your music tonight? No, what happens is the, all the bars in Spain or New York or London, they pay money into a fund, they pay a subscription every year, and that money is then given out to Madonna or whoever else based on how, mu much, music there was, they, how much their music was listened to. And obviously with things like Spotify, we already see something like that for all music. It's a subscription model and then money's distributed. The problem with Spotify and the problem with the current, well, the platform economy is we have another monopolist just at another level up controlling those platforms. Now, what we need to do is make those platforms kind of regulated. They want to be platforms where the music is open, we all have to subscribe and pay our subscription fee, but then the price that Spotify or anyone else can do is set. We have a fair subscription fee and then the money's given out to artists fairly. Or if we do it for medicine, we can have a spotty farmer. We do Spotify, but for medicines, we put our money in a fund through a subscription fee. The money goes to innovators who create new medicines. Their medicine recipes are open so they can make the medicines really cheaply and everyone can have them, but the innovators get paid. So first, just to very simply for people, they don't pay any more money because any money they're paying in these subscription fees is cancelled out by the less money they now pay for the good when they buy it. It's now free, right? You pay, so for example, pay music. It turns out if you do the maths, everyone in Spain could have free access to music, open access to music, and pay creators all over the world who sell music to Spanish people the same amount of money, and it would cost under a euro per person per month. Right now, Spotify costs 10 euros. So for a tenth of the price, all Spanish people can have a free Spotify for everyone. Even better than that, you know, you can use it in movies, you can use it, in, you can reuse them in stuff, and creators get paid in a fairer and better way. I would start, if I were trying to pilot this model in an area, don't do it for everything. So let's take medicines. People already largely buy their medicines through state insurance. You pay your taxes, you get insurance, or even private insurance. So they already pay a subscription fee and then get it. What they don't see behind the scenes is we're then purchasing these medicines at these incredibly expensive prices. Now what that means is already in Europe, 
for example, in Spain, there are people, even on their insurance plan, who will not get certain medicines because they're so expensive. Now, in my model, I'm suggesting, let's just take that money we're already correcting through tax and subscription fee and start using remuneration rights as a way to pay for that innovation rather than this crazy model with monopoly rights and patents. You don't need to go change everywhere at the same time. So you could start with the remuneration rights switch to go from patents and copyright to remuneration rights for a particular thing, music or medicines. You could pick one area and you can do it in one country. You don't need to go do the whole world. Why? Everywhere else can keep patents and copyright. So imagine that, I don't know, the US switches to open music tomorrow. Okay, inside the US, music is now open and free to anyone. But outside the music, US, copyright still exists. Inside the US, they now got this remuneration rights fund and that's how they pay artists. Outside the US, you still get paid by copyright model. So you can switch gradually to the remuneration rights system. You don't have to do all the countries at once. And you don't have to do all the areas at once. You can start with music. Then you could do medicines. Then you could do movies. Then you could do software. Then you could do databases. You, know, you can move gradually. And that's crucial. This is politically feasible. It's not asking everyone to change all the rules of intellectual property tomorrow. No, we can do it country by country. And you can even, don't even need to get rid of intellectual property to start with. You could say, hey, copyrights of patents are licensed into the Remuneration Rights Fund. We're not even getting rid of them. We're just licensing them into this fund. Yeah. So, you know, like I grew up on a farm. Like as a kid, I played in the stream, we had sheep and cattle, my people working on the farm. And when I started on the farm, there were like five or six people who worked with us. By the time I grew up, we had one, one and a half people using us. And just to give you one example, when I was a kid, we had to put straw out for the animals when they're in the winter so they could sleep on something. And you'd you'd have these bales of straw and then you'd get in the pen and you'd use a fork and you'd fork around the straw. By the time I left for university, we had a machine that would take the whole bale and just automatically throw it into pieces into the pen. And it meant that rather than needing two guys for a day, you could do all the work in a, in a tractor in two hours. Now, that's just ubiquitous. Like One of the things humans have done for thousands of years through innovation is save labor. And generally, it's, it, and it's a really great thing. It means it was quite tedious forking around straw for a whole day. And now I could just be in a tractor and do it in two hours. Now, when does that relate to data or information? Well, even in that case, the tractor on that farm, there were all kinds of things. Someone had to design that device that with these whirly things that would rip apart the bale and throw it out into the pen. Someone had to design it. It then had to get built in a factory with machines that would build all the components. It then had to be attached to a tractor, which was itself designed. Now, that design is what we would call, I would call, information or even data. Now, it might just live in someone's head. Oh, this is, you know, when the first man, human came up with the idea of a wheel, it was an idea, but it's information in our head. And that, that, from my point of view, is information or data. And so to go back to this story of the farm, my, I wouldn't have noticed it. I, if you said to me, what is information? I'd have been like, what are you talking about? But actually, the design, the, those, the, those machines and stuff get built are largely the product, like more and more of the cost of them or the value of them is in the design of them, the information of them, right? Rather than the, 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 the actual atoms, the steel that makes it. So even on that farm, more and more of your wealth, even if you don't think, if even you're one of these, I don't even want to use email, actually your life is being affected by information because the things that you use, even if you're on a farm, the machines you use are the product of people working on computers, designing stuff, of, of, of information data. Now, at another level, data also, we just mean in the common parts, is also even more raw than that. It's the kind of data we collect about things. And even there, you know, like, People now affect your life whether you notice it or not. Every time 
you even go through a traffic light. The traffic light's being controlled by a computer somewhere that will have some data. Every time you go on Google and you do a search, data is being used to find you the right search results. So that's even data in the more pure form. What I want to get is that actually data is part of this really broad set of information, which is anything that's kind of ideas or knowledge. And that's just everywhere in our lives. Almost every device we now use in our life is designed somewhere. And it wasn't probably designed manually. It was designed on a computer. It was helped being built with a computer, etc. And that's what we mean by information. So back in the day, there was all this news that would come out, like information people wanted to know, and people created newspapers. So what normally will happen is no one expects that ordinary citizens are going to go download hundreds of megabytes of data. What happens is we get a class of what we might call intermediaries. Those could be newspapers, but they could be entirely new type of people who translate that data into irrelevant stuff. I mean, and I think there's going to be huge demand for that kind of class of people in the future, both for the general public, but also just like you hire a lawyer to tell you, even though you could go read the law, right? You could go read all the legal text. No, you hire a lawyer because they already know all about it. They give you an expert opinion quickly. Or let's say you get ill. You could go and buy a medical textbook and start diagnosing yourself. You don't. You go to a doctor because they've read all the textbooks and they have a lot of expertise. Similarly with data, I think people are going to more and more go to professionals, kind of data, if you like, people, intermediaries, like lawyers are an intermediary, doctors are an intermediary, um, engineers are a kind of intermediary. People are going to go to these intermediaries and help them use data to understand or address whatever question or challenge they have. Right now, the information is largely owned, concentrated in the hands of monopolists. What, when you look across industries, I mean, in software, most industry, most actors, areas are dominated by a very few number of companies, um, and many of whom, their founders are incredibly wealthy. Google, Facebook, Oracle, you know, even looking within verticals in software, um, you know, Amazon, etc. That's who currently owns the future. Now, I want, the thing is, I'm not against wealth, by the way. I want to emphasize that what I'm for is opportunity. I'm all for real competition and real free markets. I'm for a decent, decent wages for a decent job. That's what's not working today, is we have a tiny, we have a huge hollowing out of the middle. And at the moment, the future is owned by not even the 1%, by the 0.0001% who happen to own the AIs or the machine learning or this or that. It does not need to be that way. And actually, that's even bad for the 0.001%. It's bad for innovation, because when we actually share knowledge out, we get way more innovation. And it's also bad for the entrepreneurs of the future. We want people in the future to have an opportunity and not have to just go work at one of the dominant companies. We want an a future that's really owned by everyone. So what I'm saying is currently who owns the future is the few. Who should open the future? Who can open the future? All of us. And the way to do that is the open revolution. Make all non-personal information, software, music, movies, databases, make it all open free for anyone to use, build on and share, and create remuneration rights to pay creators and innovators fairly and equitably. You know, ironically, sometimes more information, at least for, dis for particularly if it's bad quality information, obviously it could be a needle and haystack problem. If I'm getting more bad information, it makes the needle of insight harder to find if I've just got all this data. But I do, ultimately and generally, more is better, but it is a question of quality. In addition, we do need good systems of bringing information together, bringing different views together to make good choices. And that's almost outside of, I mean, people have had fake news since ancient Athens. Fake news ain't new. It may be worse right now, or might, I don't know even if you know whether it's worse, but people have had that problem of, at least as human groups, we have selection bias, we hear what we want to hear, we don't agree with other people. 
That's a much deeper question you're asking me. And by the way, I'm passionate about answering that question too. And I've got a whole separate project called Art Earth Tech, which is about how we really transform humanity, you know, really. But that's a deeper question, like why are humans not open-minded? Why, why don't we want to hear things that disagree with what we already think? That's a deep question and probably not one to go into now, but I have a whole bunch of answers. Uh, you know, I'm a Buddhist, by the way, so part of that would be to do how we identify with our ego and identify with our views. We literally think that what we believe is part of us. And so if someone threatens what we believe, we feel threatened, which is ludicrous. But that's how we live as human beings. I want to read you something to answer that, which is uh, just a moment. I'm just going to look in the drive. Um. You ask me, like, why do I do this? And I do all these things. So, so this is the true joy in life, to be used for a purpose greater than yourself. To be used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one. To be a force of nature rather than a feverish little clod of ailments complaining that the world won't accommodate itself to what you want to be. I am of the opinion that my life belongs to the whole community and that as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die. I want to be thoroughly used up. For the harder I work, the bigger I become. The more I live and the more I rejoice in life for its own sake. Life is no brief candle to me, no shadow. It is a sort of splendid torch that I have got hold of for instant, and my job is to make it burn as brightly as I can before I pass it on to the next generation. So that is my opinion, that that is the true joy in life, to be used for a purpose recognized as yourself and as myself as a mighty one, and to do for the community all that I can, to be fully used up when I die, and to take this thing that is called life and live it fully. I mean, it comes, just to say for that part, it's my sentiments, it comes from Man and Superman by George Bernard Shaw. Yeah, and it's incredible. And it's like, the other thing I just want to say is I'm a Buddhist, so I believe also in being present and in mindfulness very deeply. So, but like, the more present you are and the less attached you are, the more committed you can become. And it's when we live for only ourselves that we are most miserable. It's when we expand ourselves, when we become committed to something of a generous good that we grow, and that we transcend ourselves. There's so much we could do, politically. One of the big problems is, particularly younger people, by younger people I mean even under 45 or under 40, they think the state is corrupt or incompetent. It isn't. The state's amazing. The state is amazing. But people are just cynical at the moment, and they're resigned. And far too many people are cynical and don't do anything. They just complain. So that's the other thing. Yes, there is hope. Yes, there is belief. I mean, you know, to end on that, in fact, one other thing I could say is the Art Earth Tech is this other group I'm very involved in that I help found. Uh, I'm going to just read this to you, which is, this is what Art Earth Tech, I think, we, in terms of where we go, there is a growing intuition that something is deeply the matter. That despite so much material progress, we are not truly satisfied, happy and at peace. There is a fear of the future, a lack of visionary hope, and we distrust ourselves as a species and our capacity to manage our world wisely. As the world has become more complex and intertwined, it requires patience, rigor, qualitative observation, emotional honesty, deep thinking, creative application, collective action, and very few groups do that. There is, now the problem we have, that's just where we are, the problem, the challenge we have, 
is there is distrust of big visions in the world today, of any solution that isn't material or technological. You know, if I started talking about spirituality and politics, people would laugh. Even 100 years ago, it was assumption that there was a moral foundation to a political order. There was a spiritual and moral foundation. We need to re-spiritualize. I don't mean new religion, but re-spiritualize. Have a vision of what it is to be human. We can't just be, everyone does their own thing. It's the free market, man. Everyone just does whatever they want. No, that isn't a community. That can work for economic production. It does not work for reduction of a community. Humans are not just a consume. We just get our stuff. No, we, the biggest thing we need is other people. So there is this distrust of any solution that isn't material or technological. Bold and powerful visions of the future are subject to knee-jerk dismissal or destructive debate, which prevents their proposal and realization. We are stuck in a bankruptcy of ideology and vision in politics. There's no people like, oh, a bit more of that or a bit more of that. You know, it's equivalent to like the iPhone upgrade. You know, I'll get a little bit better capitalism, you know, with a bit more redistribution or a bit more free market side. No, that's not, that's just, no, we need something big that speaks to us. A progressive vision that involves a real vision of like humanity. Now, what I'm saying is, this prevents, we need a breakthrough in individual and collective being, but a breakthrough here is hard as it requires a consensus of foundational values and views, including the belief in the possibility of transformation, hope, and the nature and primacy of being. The question we should ask ourselves, what are the foundational views and values, a big vision and its associated roadmap, and how do we facilitate consensus needs and their implementation in the next 50 to 200 years? And I would suggest the step forward are you develop a community of people based on a shared culture and a shared views that include the possibility of transformation. And what I mean by that is many people today, if you ask them, look, can we do something? They're like, oh no, politicians are corrupt, no one cares, everyone's self. No, I'm like, no, there is hope. It doesn't mean it's going to work out, but it's possible. So the possibility of transformation, the primacy of being, getting stuff done, and tolerant universalism, and with a focus on the development of a big vision and committed to powerful practical action to realize it on the time scale of our lifetimes and those of our children. People need to come together with shared values and views and start a solo. They don't have to always be the same, you can have different communities, but coming together and then living in line with that and then taking action to create a political movement. By political, I don't mean in traditional politics, but a movement with an agenda for how you organize society and implement that.